What is it about consciousness that drives philosophers, scientists mm -hmm. absolutely crazy? I think that any academic, whether they're scientists, whether they're philosophers, you always start off by defining your terms. And as soon as you do that, then you run into the problem because how do you define consciousness? would define flying, for example, as defying gravity. Or you could have referral to what we'd call a higher set. You could say a table is a piece of furniture. Love is an emotion. Now, let's try either of those two strategies with consciousness. Consciousness is when you do what? You can be <laughs> sitting perfectly still, not doing anything, not saying anything. Yeah, you can still be conscious. So that operational definition doesn't work. What about the other strategy? Consciousness is a, a what? What's higher than that? Now, someone could get out of it and say it's a property of the brain, but that's is what someone once called an anaesthetic explanation. It's not an explanation at all. Right. What we really need to do is to be very picky, and whilst we can't say what consciousness is, we can certainly say what it is not. So what we have to do is distinguish consciousness from unconsciousness. Um, so consciousness can be defined as what you lose when you go to sleep, let's say, or perhaps a little bit more formally you could say it's the inner subjective state that no one else can hack into. So, so le let's then get to the core, which is this inner subjectivity. And that inner subjectivity can be expressed with lots of different content. So mm -hmm. The fundamental question is, is consciousness just the absolute sum of whatever the content is at the moment? Or is there something additional in consciousness that we are unaware of well, to make the inner subjectivity? Yeah, okay, you so, can't get away from no, this question. So it is the subjectivity that really, that really is the nub of the problem, because I think that's where science flounders. Science is all about measuring things. It's all about quantification. Now, take consciousness. We've just said it's essentially, quintessentially, subjective, and what is there to quantify? So let's, let's just put that square on, mm. because clearly it does posit that there's some little man or little woman inside your head, some fat controller, and obviously that's crazy. And it, the question I'd like to ask you back, if I said to you now, right, guess what? It's your lucky day. Today I woke up and I discovered how the brain generated consciousness. I, I now know how mm -hmm. it happens. Mm -hmm. What would you expect me to show you? Would you expect to see a brain scan, a formula? Would you expect you to suddenly feel like me? What? And until we can even articulate what kind of answer, right. how can we deliver it? Now, my own view with the subjectivity is there's two fallacies that I think we run up against the thing fallacy and the readout fallacy. And the readout fallacy is simply, what does it read out to? The buck stops with the brain. Mm. And so when people talk about encoding, it implies that the code is decoded back. That's a fallacy because a code is something that's translated back again. What's right. it translated right. back to? Right. Yeah. So, right. so nothing is encoded. The word is wrong to use. Yeah. The other is the thing. When people talk about consciousness, they reify consciousness as though it's something you can hold and deal with. And so, mm. you know, mm. when really it's a process. It's not a noun, you know, it's, it's something, it's a, it's, a, it's a verb, if you like, it's being conscious. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the other problem. So clearly, the, as a scientist, one's faced with this real problem of how do you deal with something which is an anathema to our trade, you know, which is subjective and which you can't measure.